So spring's over for most everybody, and it's time for some early season polls, even though a lot of them don't make any sense. You are Locked On Bama, your daily podcast on the Alabama Crimson Tide, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, everybody. Welcome back into Locked On Bama. Luke Robinson, that's me. Jimmy Stein, that's him. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel, and I'll tell you about FanDuel here in just a bit. Thank you for making us your first listen every single day. Jimmy ESPN has come out with their post-spring, way-too-early top 25. And, uh, you know, look, I make fun of these things, and then when they come out, I'm the first one to click on it. I mean, it's because I know it's so dumb. It really is because – there's still some transfer port. I mean, Alabama may be getting a transfer yeah. portal commitment today. So could be two. Could be two. Maybe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, Auburn got one from Akron yeah. yesterday. <laughs> so I mean it, it just happened. Anyway, um, you know, look, the ESPN, no shock. They have Georgia number one. I would put Georgia number one. Would you? Yes, I would. And they actually say Carson Beck could be the first pick in the NFL draft. I'm down with that. If you don't put Georgia number one, I think you have to put Ohio State number one, and they come in at number two on ESPN's poll. I now, here's where things get dicier for me. Oregon is number three. Now, I agree. Look, I agree. That's where I, I mean, I'm not saying Alabama should be, but that's about the spot where I'm like, wait, is Oregon better than Alabama? They might be, though. They might be. I mean, they could be, and I guess if you want to look schedule-wise, um, it's so funny. They play Oregon State uh, in the battle for the Gord- Golden Beaver or whatever it is. Uh, I don't think that's it. But, I don't think uh, that's it, but I love that. I, I think they should We should play that. someone for one of those. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, that so September 14th, which is kind of weird. But, you know, I'm looking at their schedule. They do have Ohio State at home. They are at Michigan, but I don't think Michigan's going to be great. They are at Wisconsin, and they have Washington at home. Washington has been their bugaboo, but, of course, Washington has a new coach now because, you know, we stole their coach. So I guess looking at their schedule and their talent level, uh, even though they're breaking in a new quarterback, it, 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 I guess not breaking him in, it's Dylan Gabriel. So, I mean, he's, yeah. he's got some experience. Um, I wonder if Dylan Gabriel and Malachi Moore are the two most experienced players in college football. Oh, they got to be. They gotta I mean, Malachi has been starting games since 2020. It's not only Malachi's fifth year. It's his fifth year starting games. I mean, I, I don't think Malachi – well, there was a time when Malachi was the dime back. Yeah. So he played with the first team, but but he wasn't out there for every snap of the game. He's only out there when we were in dime. So I'm sure that affected things. But I'm just – every time I, I think of Dylan Gabriel, I think of Malachi more because I'm like, wow, those, those two have been around a long time. But, no, that's – yeah, they're they're breaking Dylan Gabriel into their new into their system. I would argue, though, as a college quarterback, I mean, how about this? They lose Bo Nix as the twelfth pick in the draft. Probably haven't really fallen off at quarterback. Probably not. I mean, but Dylan Gabriel's not as good of an NFL prospect as Bo, in my opinion. I I, I think Dylan Gabriel's a day three pick if that. So then they go Texas, which again I buy that, and I'm looking at their schedule, and yeah, they got Georgia at home. Um, that's going to be tough. They're number one, obviously, and they travel to Michigan. That could be tough, but Michigan's got a lot of turnover. Um, you know, they're at A&M at the end of the year, but eh, I didn't do much. Um, they got Florida at home. That You know, I'm, I'm looking at their schedule going, okay, I'll buy that. Now, here's another place. That I think Texas was, or Oregon. If Texas and Oregon played on a neutral field, who would win? I say Texas. I think Texas, too. I would have Texas higher. That might be my SEC bias and uh, – Dean, first time I've ever used Texas and said SEC bias. Uh, but uh, Texas, I, I think Texas will be better than Oregon. But I do think it's tight. We need to we need to recall that Texas lost to Washington, you know, in the in the playoff, who 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 beat or who did beat Oregon twice. But I'm just saying Washington beat Texas. Maybe we shouldn't assume that or, or Oregon might. But I'm going to say Texas, like you. So I would have Texas three, and and Oregon oh. later. Okay, then they have Notre Dame at five. All right, again, I, I kind of get it because their schedule is cupcake. I mean, they're at AM at the beginning, at USC at the end, and in between, I mean, the toughest game is probably Louisville at home. 
I mean, they got Florida State at home, I guess. Um, or, you know, right. but they got Virginia Army. So <clears throat> I, I get that. Um, but do I think Alabama would beat Notre Dame? My answer is yes. Now, in an effort to not just go through this whole thing, uh, I'm going to be spoiler alert and read off very quickly the teams they also have ahead of Alabama. Number six, Ole Miss. I've, okay. I mean, that seems like a, hey, we're fascinated with you to me. Uh, number seven, Missouri. That seems like, hey, we're fascinated about you pick to me. And number eight, Penn State. Hey, you know, Penn State's lost a lot of dudes too. And here's the other thing. Their quarterback, Drew Aller, um, has not been great. And I'm not sure he's going to be great. I thought he was going to be great when he got there. But then you come to number nine, Alabama. And the only reason that I can fathom having Alabama at nine below Penn State, below Missouri, who, by the way, Alabama plays at home, so that should be set on the field, so I'm not super worried about it, below Notre Dame, and even if you want to stretch it a little bit below Oregon, is because you think Alabama's schedule is that difficult at Wisconsin, you know, Georgia at home, uh, at Tennessee, at LSU, at Oklahoma. Th- th- those are some tough games. I'm not arguing that. But Alabama's bringing back, the, I guess, isn't Jalen Milrow the highest – Vote getting returning Heisman guy from last year. Correct. 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 So that is correct. I mean, and you you yes, you're replacing Nick Saban, but you're replacing him with a guy that played for the national championship at Washington last year. You're replacing him with a guy that has a three game winning streak against Oregon, who everybody's fascinated with. You're replacing him with the guy who beat Texas last year, which Alabama couldn't do, and uh they have a Texas ranked ahead of them now with a lesser team, if you ask me. I, I don't know. I just boy, I'm I have mixed emotions. I'm kind of glad we're getting disrespected because maybe now it gives us a chance to play with our chip on our shoulder. But part of me is like, wow, we, y'all think we dropped off that much, huh? Yeah, I feel the same way. On the one hand, I'm, I am I want to be low. I want to be – for Alabama, I mean, I, I like the idea that we're not the favorite, that, that we have something to prove. I, I like that. I mean, but at the same time, then you see the rankings and you get a little rankled. You're like – so wait a minute. We haven't lost to Ole Miss in nine years. Uh, it's been, that's right, right? We haven't lost to them since the 2015 game, and and now they're and now now they're better than than Alabama. We've beaten Lane Kiffin every year that that he's been at Ole Miss, and 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 now they're better th- th- than Alabama and Notre Dame. Again, you might be factoring in schedule because they don't. We don't play each other. And they do – their toughest game is uh, Georgia at home. So but here's my, my thing about factoring the schedule now, Luke. To me, I look at it a little differently now. It's like, well, yes, Alabama plays a tougher schedule, but what 12 teams are going to the playoff? And then it's settled on the field from there. And it's true that because of Alabama's C, uh, schedule, Alabama might go into the playoff as the number 10 team and not the number two team because they've lost a couple of times. But then once you get to the playoff, it's sort of like everyone's starting over again. Everybody's zero and zero once the playoffs start. To me, to me, it's just about with those top 12 teams, who's going to beat who in the playoff is sort of the way I look at it. But maybe I shouldn't be looking at it like I'm forecasting who's going to win the national championship and what order teams are going to finish in in the playoff. I, maybe I shouldn't look at it that way. And maybe you're right to look at it like, well, what are these teams' records going to be? And, and you do well, have you to factor There's always been two ways to determine your preseason top 25. The order you think that ultimately everybody will finish in and the order you think they are as of this moment. Yeah. Um, And that's that, you know, a lot of people end up conflating the two and and they sort of pick a little bit of sort of merge them. and, And that's not a way to go either. I think you either have to have a philosophy of these are the, top 25 teams as of this moment, or this is where I think it will play out at the end of the year. If you're doing as of this moment, you don't factor in the schedule. If you do it as where I think it's going to end up, I think you have to factor in the schedule. And if you do, and I think ESPN did like most everybody else, they merged the two. And if you factor in the schedule, then I think you have to say, okay, Georgia is at Ole Miss, Georgia is at Alabama, and Georgia is at Texas. Those are a According to you guys, those are 
three of the top nine teams in the country. So you still have Georgia one, even though they're on the road to those three teams. That yeah. it, you know what I mean? So yeah. it, it it's just uh I feel I like imagine Georgia winning those three and then going to the playoff and then winning the three there. You now I bought up this point the other day about how difficult the playoff is. And, and this occurred to me for the first time, but Luke, imagine this. So Michigan wins the national championship, right? They beat Alabama and then they beat Washington to win the national championship. And that's really impressive and everybody should clap. And they are the, no doubt the national champions. What if they had to play Georgia the next week? That's what the playoff is. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what they did last year is not, not nearly good enough. They got to win one more and against theoretically a better team than they played against Alabama, Washington. What, what I mean is you've got to win three in a row against elite teams. Winning two in a row is hard. Heck, they only beat Alabama in overtime by one play. I mean, I'm just saying, imagine if Michigan played Georgia. They wouldn't have beat Georgia that next week because they'd be too tired. That said, would Georgia have even gotten? there to the final game because they didn't even get out of the, the SEC. So saying that whoever wins the playoff will have damn sure earned it. That's true. All right. Let's talk a little fan duel. It's winner take all time in the NBA and NHL and fan duels giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and much more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on, FanDuel.com slash locked on, FanDuel.com slash locked on, and make every single playoff shot count. If you're watching the Nuggets and the Timberwolves, man, that thing is getting weird. T-Wolves are just blowing them out. And you need to go to Fan. FanDuel.com slash locked on and get in on the action. FanDuel is America's number one sports book. Okay, so speaking of way too early, top 25s, there is at least one top 25 that has Alabama number one in the country in basketball for next year. And I, you know, and we talked about this yesterday, I don't even know what to feel. Um, it's awesome. I love it. It is also frightening to have that, that crown on your head, but boy, I'm beginning to embrace it more and more as the minutes pass by. And, um, I'm as excited about basketball starting next year as I am football, which is very weird to say. Um, even though I have always loved basketball, I've always loved Alabama basketball. Uh, football is, is the thing, man, I'm getting super excited. And, you know, the, as the, some, Maybe some schedule stuff will start leaking out. You know, obviously the Creighton home game date has been set. It's in mid-December. You know, maybe we'll find out about that Las Vegas thing. I have had several people ask in the comments, hey, when does the basketball schedule come out? Uh, probably around August. I mean, I, I mean, like it's usually a late thing. Mm -hmm. Now, we might know if we're playing in that Las Vegas tournament before then. We might know, you know, uh, I think we already know when we're playing Arizona in Birmingham. Um, and we might know something else, but we we won't know the SEC schedule for some time. Now we know who we're. I think we already know who we're playing. I think we already know like who the the teams we double up on are. But um, we we don't have any of the dates and everything. And, and you got to remember the next year Texas and Oklahoma are coming into this thing, and uh, that's going to make stuff even more interesting. Is uh, Oklahoma just picked up J uh, not JP Pegues, uh Who was it? Duke Miles that Auburn was going after really hard. And so, I mean, you know, Alabama's going to face that dude one way or the other. He's from Montgomery originally. Uh, they're going to, have to play Texas, who's picked up a really good uh, recruiting class again this year. And, man, it's, it's just – it's a lot of fun to think about that. It's great to have two sports to look forward to like this. I mean, I, I never would be talking about basketball this much five years ago. And now, I mean, I feel like we're talking about basketball at least a little bit every podcast. Remember a couple of years ago when Alabama football beat Georgia in the SEC championship game and that same night Alabama beat Gonzaga in Seattle? That was one of the great football basketball days in the history of, of the school. Uh, but how about this, Luke? With bas If basketball starts out preseason number one, could we for the first time in school history and maybe for one of the few times in NCAA 
history that this has ever been done, if both the basketball team and football team are ranked number one at the same time, that would be, I mean, it's never happened in Alabama because Alabama's only been number one in the AP poll, I think, once or twice during the Godfrey era. I think they were number one in the country uh, under Godfrey is when Alabama was. was well, we were number first. one two years ago. Yeah, yeah, number one, yeah. But the football was the football football team wasn't number one then. I think the basketball team wasn't number one until basketball no. season, until yeah, yeah. the conference, it was the conference the games. All right, and the football yeah. team did not finish the year of the national champions. Yeah. Uh, I'm just saying being number one at the same time in both sports, I, I'm sure I, I'm sure that's never happened at Alabama. Uh, I, I don't even know where happened. it could have happened. I mean, I guess it could have happened at like Florida Michigan. won the national championship in the same school year. Oh, true. But 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 I, I don't know that they were ranked number one at the same time, which is a little different, slightly different. Obviously, you got to be more impressed with what Florida did, you know, with the Billy Donovan and Urban Meyer tag team winning the national championship in the same school year. That's nuts. Yeah. I think, um, I, I think Alabama, now that we see how good we are in basketball and, and football has kind of always, always been there. But the point is, I think now at Alabama, maybe we have a greater appreciation for what Florida did. It's like, wow, that's hard. You know, in, in, in a way is a little bit of the same trajectory, right? I mean, you had a, I mean, Urban Meyer, whatever you think of him, is a pretty legendary coach, and Alabama had a legendary coach in football. And then they get a young up-and-comer yeah, uh, with Billy sort of a different Nate Oates. style. There's some yeah. Billy Donovan, Nate Oates thing. And I, I'm predicting, I know people hate to hear this, but I think one day Nate Oates will coach in the NBA. I, I think one day he will. Uh, uh, now, when oh, hopefully that's a long time for him. And frankly, I'll be, I, I bet it's not until his kids are grown. You know, I think I – think, He's going to be a college coach until his kids are out of college. Uh, but, I, I mean, I, I think down the road uh, I can see Nate Oates coaching the NBA. It's kind of seeking out that challenge. Uh, I could see it, too, and it does scare me. But I, I'm like you. I don't think he'd do it till the kids were out of the house. And um, uh, the, the other thing that, you know, I, I do a show with some Auburn guys, and um, it's, it's sort of weird where we are right now because – it's very difficult for me to give Bruce Pearl compliments, even though I'll say this, Bruce Pearl um, is doing some stuff here around Lake Martin that is uh, very altruistic, very uh, philanthropic, and it's very cool. And he he, he is good about uh, doing fundraising events, et cetera. And uh, so I appreciate that aspect of him. But, you know, I guess the question comes down to, would you rather have Nate Oates or Bruce Pearl? And you, you, I mean, I think immediately every Alabama fan would say Nate Oates. I would. Um, but here's the thing Nate Oates is much more likely to be coaching somewhere else eventually than Bruce Pearl is. Bruce Pearl is going to end his career at Auburn. I, I fully exactly. believe that. Now, his career might not be all too much longer, but, and, and if Nate Oates is a lifer at Alabama, good Lord, what, what damage will he do? But, um, I would take my chance with Nate Oates personally. I, I just, <laughs> Love Nate Oates. I think he's fantastic. And I think if the only thing people have against him right now, and this is what you see constantly on Auburn message boards, is he you know, he runs a rogue program. I mean, y'all get out of here. Get out of here with that jazz. Well, I mean, where do I, you, I mean, is it the Brandon Miller stuff? I mean, where is it? It is, is, which is which is really just people not wanting to admit, okay, that was Brandon Miller had literally nothing to do with that. So um, but anyway, regardless, uh, Jimmy, I need to uh, go ahead now. I think I got to tell you about Monopoly Go. In fact, I do. And in fact, I did it at the right time. And then I clicked the wrong thing. So here we go. <laughs> okay. Game off. We got to pause here and talk more about Monopoly Go. I know what you're saying. Flag on the play. You've already talked about that. But there's just so much good stuff about this game. In Monopoly Go, you can team up with friends for time tournaments when you work together to build up each other's boards. The more you win together, the more awesome prizes you unlock. And there's so much to get, like unique stickers, cool new playing pieces to travel the boards with. All that stuff is available at Monopoly Go. Plus, Monopoly Go feels new and exciting every day with constantly changing tournaments and challenges. A ton include their own unique mini games like Digging for Treasure or Robot pachinko machine, whatever that is. And there's always new timed events that help you win big, like massive multipliers for everything you win or rent frenzies. There's always something fun to discover in Monopoly Go, so get off the bench and go download it for free on Google Play or on the App Store. Game on. 
All right, so kind of thought we would have a transfer portal commitment by now. We Again, we have a sweet track record of talking about getting a potential commitment or somebody coming back or getting in the portal or coming, to whatever, putting out a podcast, hypothesizing, and then five minutes after we post the podcast, that deal is cut. And so our stuff looks way behind. So I'm going to assume that once we put this podcast out, Alabama will have two commitments from the transfer portal. I think, uh, you know, BOL, we've uh, tracked the uh, recruitments of Deshaun Jones and uh, Gino Vandermeer uh, really well. Of course, Vandermeer is sort of a, a newer name for people because kind of just became evolved with him, Michigan State offensive lineman. But uh, we feel good at BOL that, that both guys are, are likely to uh, to to, to – commit to Alabama and that that could happen today. I thought it might even happen yesterday and it didn't. So who knows about the timing of such things and if the, even the players themselves are concerned with making a public commitment. <laughs> sometimes they're 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 very sometimes these kids can be very like self-interested in terms of like hey, I need to you know they they get wrapped up in what they need to do to make the move to Tuscaloosa and leave where they are and and, and maybe making a public announcement isn't at the top of their to-do list. But um, I, I do think I would project, and, and, you know, I feel pretty good about this happening. We got a good uh, track record, BOL, for sure, about the, these sort of things. And, and Deshaun, uh, in particular, I think would be a starter at Alabama. I think Deshaun Jones would start at cornerback against Western Kentucky in the opener. Uh, and then we'll see if he can hold on to that position all year long because Alabama's got such talented freshman backups there that, that want to get on the field. They're good, real uh, talented kids. Vandermeer is a little different. To me, Vandermeer Mir is the replacement for James Brockermeyer. I mean, he's Brockermeyer out, Vandermeer in is sort of the way I look at it. I think he would be the number two center, and I think he would sort of be an upgrade to Brockermeyer in this, in this sense, Luke. He can play multiple spots he might end up being the sixth offensive lineman, which Alabama doesn't really have, and they, they very badly need that, a sixth guy, meaning, hey, are you really going to get through the whole season with five guys healthy? I mean, Vandermeer would be the next up. He would obviously be the top substitute in the interior positions, and then in the instance that Alabama lost a tackle, he'd probably play some, uh, you know, some musical chairs but uh, I think Vandermeer would then start inside. Maybe Tyler Booker would kick out to tackle. You know, in in the in the case of of significant injury, that's that's one possibility. Uh, but just saying, I think we I think Geno Vandermeer could be the sixth lineman, and Deshaun Jones a starting cornerback. So adding those two would be really really big uh, for the twenty uh, twenty four football team. Yeah, I agree with you, and. Um... Look, they're not going to be too sexy ads. I mean, the people are going to, you know, they may be um, greeted with a relative meh, but I, but I think that they're, you know, you need some of that depth. And that's the one thing that the transfer portal, you know, you, you give up a lot of depth and you go get some other depth. I mean, and the fact that we lose some guys, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of somebody, help me out, Jimmy, somebody, not a Caleb Down, somebody that was, you know, like a James Brockemeyer, that's pretty good. Well, how do we know this guy isn't better than James Brockemeyer? Now, He's if you said better. he started yeah, if, eight games in the Big Ten, if you said we lost, I don't know, uh, Justice Haynes and we brought in some dude that was, you know, only an occasional starter, mostly second team dude for Michigan State, then I'd be like, yeah, that's a downgrade. There's no way to spin it. But if you're telling me that this guy is more multi purpose from Michigan State, he's played. James Brockermeyer really hadn't played any, and um, he's been it's there a while, and he hasn't played great. yet. So, I mean, again, I, I know, like, at I, first it was fair to say he's an upgrade. I don't know who Deshaun Jones is an upgrade to because I'm not sure who, let's say, Alabama returned everyone at corner. We didn't have that gigantic attrition thing. Who would be starting at cornerback? Maybe Des Ricks. Well, at least Deshaun Jones, we know what he is. I mean, we just think Des Ricks is going to be a good player, and I think he is going to be a good player. But Deshaun Jones, at least, is a little more proven, I mean, at this level. I mean, he's started for more – he's basically been a two-year starter at Wake Forest and has played well in big games, uh, uh, even against good competition. So, uh, Alabama's done really well in the portal. Let's also remember we signed the Lou Groza Award winner in the portal. You get your starting left tackle, Caden Proctor, from the portal. Jeremy Bernard – 
uh, is being talked about maybe as even a potential first round pick. You get him out of the portal. Parker Brailsford, all Pac-12 center. You get him out of the portal. Uh, here's a guy who had a good spring. We haven't talked about enough. LT Overton was uh, impressive this spring at Alabama. He's going to be I, – I think he's going to end up kind of sharing the bandit position with Jameer and Latham. I think they're kind of going to be a 1A and 1B uh, there. So you get Overton out of the portal. Alabama had a really good portal cycle, if you ask me, in terms of what came in. Now, in terms of what left, some of it's the new normal, but some of it was the same. I mean, you lose Caleb Downs and Isaiah Bond and stuff because Nick Saban, you know, retired. And uh, so it's been worse than normal for cycling players out uh, in, in part because of the Saban retirement, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, losing downs arguably is the, the biggest hit of any transfer in the country, right? I mean, that's, yeah. you know, maybe Ole Miss, Quinshawn Judkins. I mean, but. How about Iowa losing Caden Proctor? <laughs> yeah, that's so that's so nebulous, though, because you could say, well, the biggest hit was Alabama losing Caden Proctor. Well, then Iowa lost him. I mean, you know, it's not I doubt Miami really of Ohio. I doubt Miami of Ohio has any other first team All Americans to lose as they lost a first team All American in Graham Nicholson. Oh, good <laughs> Alabama. I think Miami of Ohio not a big fan of the transfer portal right now as they lost their 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 literal star football player. Um, as we close out, let me say this. Um. I'm going to try and find it really quickly. Uh, there's a a site, a, a Twitter page. They have a podcast, and uh, I'm, I'm going to find it while I'm talking to you. But it's out of Brazil, and uh, it's an Atlanta Falcons Brazilian uh, fan group. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of bizarre. Yeah, uh, why Falcons, do they pick the Falcons? Why do we think they – You know what? I didn't even ask that. And I, that's why I'm not a reporter because I, that's a question that I should have asked. <laughs> But it's, it's called Falcons Play Action on Twitter, so go look it up. And I did a podcast with them because, of course, they drafted Jason McClellan, and they wanted me to talk about McClellan. And um, I did. I spent a lot of time with them. And, Jimmy, this is so true. Uh, you will appreciate this. The guy, you know, again, he's in Brazil. He speaks fluent English, but, I mean, you know, he's got the accent, got whatever, and there's some things he's just trying to get involved with. This hadn't been a very old podcast. We did – 30 minutes. And then he said, all right, thank you very much for your time. And he said, boy, that's the worst Spanish. Yeah, that wasn't even Spanish. Accent. I'm not that, sure what I that was. I don't know what was that. That was almost Indian. That was terrible. I'm not going to even do it anymore. Um, <laughs> but uh, he said, uh, he said, oh, my gosh, I didn't hit record. We had to do the whole thing again. Uh, and I, if, there, is any, if there's any two people said, that can appreciate it. I caramba. Hi, <laughs> caramba. I was like, I got an undelay. Uh, but uh, it, I don't even know if that would that actually means. speak I, Portuguese in Brazil and not Spanish. So I, I probably, that I is think true. Hi, caramba. Guys, like, what, what, what is that? What are you talking about? They, they do speak Portuguese. You're absolutely right. I always know that because a friend of mine uh, got a mail order bride from there, a friend of a friend. And when she came over, uh, some, when another friend was talking to somebody, he goes, I can barely speak to her. She speaks Pekingese. We're like, that doesn't even make sense. She just barks at you. Um, but anyway, all right. So go check out that because I talked about Jason McClellan. It was interesting. So uh, it's called Falcons Play. So you talked about Jason McClellan for a long time that day. Because I, I did. You agreed to do the show again right after. And we've done that before ourselves. Well, we talked about, I think we talked a little Julio. We talked a little Calvin Ridley. We talked uh, the you know, Falcons. Yeah, just Falcons, Alabama stuff and um, just – overall thing. And I'm going to tell you, these dudes are diehard Falcons fans too. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm real curious as to how they got quote stuck with the Falcons. I, I mean, I mean, it's like, it's very random to me. Like the Falcons. It's kind of cool though, because um, sure. today I was listening to that. Uh, was it Dusty and Danny in the morning? Right. And one of their producers was talking about how he was a, a fan of, I can't remember. He was a, a fan of some team, like a popular NBA team. And then he was like, you know what? I just, I just stuck with the Thunder because oh he was an Allen Iverson fan so he's you know big Sixers and then he said I started cheering for Russell Westbrook because I didn't really like the Sixers but I liked Iverson so um, then he started cheering for Russell Westbrook he just loved him so much and he said I'm gonna stick with the Thunder you know of course Westbrook's been 17 different places since then 
And he said, you know, now the Thunder are number one seed in the West. And they look great. And he said, it's fun. He said, I, I, you know, I've been through the ringer with these guys now, and I feel good. And it, I guess there's something kind of cool. If the Falcons ever win the Super Bowl, it's going to be like Detroit winning the Super Bowl or when the Cubs finally won the World Series again, something like that. It's going to be awesome, like if you stuck it out with them. So, that's true. Uh, I that's think that's true. where they, they could. You know, anybody can just be a Dallas fan, even though they've stunk for a while. They, I'm still they get mad the about them drafting Penix, though. I, I'm still mad. I'm mad, yeah, mad about it. I mean, I think it was so. Hey, and, and here's another guy to feel bad about. Not Penix. Penix was going to be drafted by somebody and be the starting quarterback this fall. <laughs> that's true. Now he's going to sit on the bench for three years. All right, that's going to do it for today's podcast. We'll be back tomorrow with more. Until then, roll tight, everybody. Roll tight.